un échange interactif avec la salle. J'ai cru entendre et comprendre qu'il y a moyen de tweeter en live. Donc, euh, il doit y avoir un hashtag que je ne connais pas, mais je pense qu'il va apparaître quelque part sur un des écrans à un moment donné. Donc, n'hésitez pas à tweeter le plus possible. Et je pense qu'à un moment ou à un autre, euh, au moment de l'échange, il y aura moyen de, 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 de prendre l'une ou l'autre question euh, en fonction des, 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 de, 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 de l'hashtag et de la manière dont vous aurez utilisé euh, Twitter. Voilà. Sans plus attendre, je vais passer la parole à Madame Karen Schro, qui est représentante auprès de l'Union européenne du Partenariat mondial pour l'éducation. Elle nous fait l'honneur d'introduire ce panel. Je ne vous en dis pas plus, je vais lui passer la parole et je reviens juste après pour euh, vous présenter notre prochaine invitée qui nous vient tout droit du Kenya. Voilà, bonne conférence. C'est à vous. Thank you very much. Uh, can everybody see me, more or less? Uh, I want to, as I'm the first speaker, I'll take uh, the chance to thank the organizers for uh, organizing this important uh, discussion on education and on the role of local strategies in, partic in particular, which we think for the global partnership is really kind of a key to um, how we work and, and why we work. I'm going to speak to you a few minutes about the global partnership and what it is so that you have a bit of context. Not everybody knows us. I'd like to take The, because I'm the first speaker, give a bit of a more global picture in terms of what are the challenges that we're facing. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about how the partnership works, uh, not because I think you need to know it in detail, but because we think that in the post-2015 context, where we're talking about global goals on education that need to be implemented at the country level, we think the model of the global partnership might be something that we can learn from in terms of how to make uh, local solutions to these global goals that we're going to come up with together. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the crisis in financing for education, because we all know that unless we have funding for education, we won't be able to achieve the things that we're trying to do together. So the Global Partnership for Education, we're the only multilateral organization devoted specifically to education. Um, after Dakar, when the Education for All goals were created, the international community made a promise that no country that wanted to achieve those goals should not be able to do so for lack of financing. So the Fast Track Initiative was started. And Global Partnership for Education is an evolution of the Fast Track Initiative, for those of you who know who are more familiar with that. We were sort of rebranded about two years ago with a more inclusive governance and a more ambitious agenda for where we'd like to get to uh, for education. Um, who we are, who are our partners. Uh, almost 60, soon to be 60, low-income uh, countries, uh, including about 50% of those are what you would, would be either fragile or affected states, which is where we know most of the children are, are out of school. Bilateral donors, including the European Commission. Uh, the UK is also one of our largest donors. Uh, many European, large European donors and small. Romania is a very uh, loyal uh, par donor partner as well. Uh, then we have the multilateral institutions. So we have UNESCO, who has the lead, obviously, uh, on education. We have uh, UNICEF, uh, who is actually one of the supervising entities in most of the fragile and conflict affected states for the partnership. And then the World Bank. And the World Bank is the host of the Global Partnership. Uh, they are the trustee for our Global Partnership Fund, and then they're actually the managing entity in many of the countries where we're working. So that's sort of the, the traditional side of what we have. And then what we, when we rebranded and became the Global Partnerships, what we brought in was civil society, so both northern and southern civil society, as well as the teachers and the private foundations and private sector partners. Um, most of you in this room will probably know the state of affairs in terms of where we are into the education crisis. There's 127 million children not in primary, lower, and secondary school. 28.5 million primary age school in uh, conflict-affected countries. Um, that we are facing a crisis. We should be very proud of what we've achieved. With MDG2, we've almost had the number of kids uh, in school. We've almost achieved gender parity in primary school. So progress has been made, but we still have these few challenges that we're facing together. And we know that the ones that are not in school are the ones that are hardest to reach. And then as, in addition to the access problems, we have this quality of learning. So we know that 250 million children are leaving school without being able to read and write. We know that they're in overcrowded ca classrooms with teachers that are poorly paid or not trained with no teaching materials. So it's 
Moving forward with the 2015 agenda, we really need to look at access and quality of learning together. Um, as I said, I want to tell you a bit about how the partnership works because we think it could be a model for post-2015 in terms of education, how we can get that local, uh, local solutions into these global goals and these global challenges. The quote up on the screen is from the uh, UN high-level panel report on post-2015. The Global Partnership for Education was the only organization that was actually specifically named in this report, and it was specifically named to show how collaboration can bring better results. So this is a complicated picture of how we work, which I'll try to explain in a much simpler way, which is essentially the, the large global challenge is we want to get all children in school and learning. And we approach that at a country level. So all of our work is country-led. Uh, the ultimate duty bearer is, of course, the state, and so they should lead in the process for education. So we bring all the actors around the table, led by the government, with the, uh, with the donors, with civil society, with the teachers, and we come up with, and our technical assistance from our team, we come up with a strong education sector plan. It's got all the elements in it that are necessary at that, in that country context, uh, and it's endorsed by all those players, which means that going forward, everybody is equally committed to uh, monitoring and evaluating that plan, but also donors as they come in with their bilateral aid should be aligning to that plan as well. Um, the, the results that we've had so far up on the screen, we've mobilized over three billion additional euro uh, or dollars for, uh, for education for the, from the GPE fund. But I think what's interesting is also when you think about domestic financing, you can't get additional funding from GPE until you can, if you can demonstrate, unless you can demonstrate you're increasing domestic financing. So when we come up with this strong plan, we are funding the plan. We're seeing how, much, how many resources we can, uh, we can mobilize at the country level. It's a discussion with the education ministry, also a discussion with the finance ministry. So in GPE countries, domestic financing for education has gone up on average 10% of GDP. So what, how that relates to the post-2015, we do see that we're going to have a big, hopefully a big, broad, ambitious global goal on education. I think a standalone goal is something that people are, are coming to agreement we really need. But then how do we make sure that that translates into results at the country level? And we think this, this kind of model of partnership is a way forward. I want to make a specific point on civil society strengthening, because I think that's one of the key parts of this model. So. Global, the Global Partnership has provided uh, over 30 million euro to CSOs to facilitate their participation in the education policy process. This means that in many of the countries where we are working, they didn't have a coalition of civil society, or if they did, it didn't have maybe the capacity to come together and really feed into the policy process. So the GPE gives money uh, through the Global Campaign for Education, which is the CSO, say, umbrella organization working on education, to fund these national programs. Uh, to make sure that those umbrellas, those civil society organizations are really meaningfully engaged. And then they're the ones who are going to be really helping with the monitoring of, the, uh, of that program afterwards. And the number of civil society organizations involved in these local education groups, as we call them, has gone from 16 to 43 in the last two years. So we're very pleased to see that this is actually having a, a meaningful impact. Um, but all of this... Uh, isn't worth much if we don't have any money to pay for it. And we know that right now with MGG2, there was a huge push for education. Uh, financing really went up and now it's dropping off and it's really a free fall. In the last two years, commitments to education have dropped by 16%. And that's education overall. We know that the impact a lot of that aid is, is limited because it's not going to basic education. For many of the countries, over 50% of that aid never leaves the country. It's actually uh, bringing scholarships to bring uh, people from developing countries to Europe, for example, for, uh, to, to, to attend uh, schools here. So when you look at what's actually going to basic education, it's actually dropping. I think it's between 3 and 4% of ODA is actually going to basic education. Uh, and aid for emergencies is even worse. It's gone from 2% down to 1.4% of humanitarian aid. So there's a crisis in education financing from the ODA side. And there's also a decreasing domestic financing for basic education. So we're, as I said, we're, we're pleased to show that in GP countries, domestic financing is increasing. It is increasing for education, but it's, now it's tapering off. And if you look at how much of that is going to basic education, it's starting to fall. So what that means is, with a declining ODA and declining allocations for domestic finance, there's a very real risk that all of those children we've gotten into school will now be out of school, that the number of out-of-school children is going to rise. Um, 
I'll finish by just saying that we are trying to do something about that. Um, we have seen from our side that there's this increasing demand. $1.3 billion was de uh, asked, uh, demand, uh, asked for from GP for, by our developing country partners just this year. Um, at the same time as we see aid going down. So we have launched a replenishment campaign. It's a replenishment campaign for the GPE fund, but it's a replenishment campaign for education finance, and that's how we'd like everybody to see it. So we'll be having, hosted by the European Commission, many thanks, in June uh, in Brussels. Uh, we'll have a conference where we'll talk about increasing contributions to the GPE fund, but we will also talk about increasing ODA commitments to basic education and increasing domestic, domestic education budgets. And a lot of our developing country partners have already said they're going to come with strong commitments for increases in domestic finance for basic education, and they're hoping that the uh, donors come with the same message. So just to say, I hope I see you all here in June uh, to sort of to support this rallying cry to make sure that we have some money to pay for the big ambitious goals that we've set for ourselves. Thank you. Merci, uh, Madame Schro. On comprend donc qu'il y a un grand défi et qu'il est encore temps de travailler, de mettre en place des mécanismes pour répondre justement au manque de financement par rapport à l'éducation. Vous avez bien fait de souligner que les fonds alloués à l'éducation ont, ont subi des, des diminutions drastiques et qu'il faut continuer à travailler. Donc on vous donne tous rendez-vous, si j'ai bien compris, au mois de juin. Pour, pour poursuivre la discussion. Merci d'avoir planté le décor et d'avoir montré qu'il y a encore pas mal de défis et, et de challenges à relever. Sans plus attendre, je vais passer la parole à Madame Okemoa, qui nous vient du Kenya, qui est membre d'IDA International, qui va rajouter des éléments à ceux que j'ai donnés précédemment, qui travaille beaucoup à l'Université du Kenya et qui vient nous parler d'éducation sur place. On a la chance d'avoir un acteur de terrain parmi nous et qui va aussi nous parler euh, du, du, de, ses, de ses recherches, du travail qu'elle fait sur, sur place et de cette euh, magnifique euh, stratégie, je ne vous en dis pas plus, où il est question de mettre euh, les, les jeunes euh, domestiques, les jeunes enfants domestiques à l'école pour renforcer l'éducation parce que souvent on oublie aussi qu'il y, y a pas mal de défis mais il y a aussi des populations un petit peu mises à l'écart qui sont marginalisées, qui n'ont pas accès à l'éducation. Voilà en gros ce de quoi elle va parler. Je vous passe la parole et je reviens vers vous juste après. Madame Okemoa, okay, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Sorry, I do not speak French. I guess that is the next level of learning. But I want uh, to speak a little about um, a project of inclusive sustainable education by looking at um, that person that does not complete an educational cycle for one reason or another. But before I do that, I want to talk about iDay International and our main objective as iDay International. Uh, IDA International is um, an NGO interested in ensuring quality education for all children and youth in Africa. The strategy is advocacy towards African and international authorities and the public. That means that um, the person that is receiving the education uh, has a role to play international community, such as uh, us here in Brussels today, have a role to play towards contributing to this education. And more importantly, the public also has uh, an opinion to offer on the type of education and the end of that education. So IDA organizes and takes part in collective activities for local civil society organizations to advocate together and foster synergies, all aimed at um, uh, ensuring education for all. Now, IDE notes that it is not possible to achieve quality basic education for all because there are very many obstacles along the way. Some of these obstacles are social, 
Some of them are cultural, some of them are economic. You would like to know that uh, in some parts of Africa, girls may not access education because of the preference of the boy child. But we also note that in some places, the girl has more access because she is not defined as a heir, you know, of the family property. So the boy is also disadvantaged in some places. Now, what that means is that um, there is really need to focus uh, on how to ensure quality, sustainable education for all. Now, the measures uh, would have to be really, really exceptional because we know that uh, there are uh, those children who have a barrier towards that education and that uh, they will uh, miss out if we focus only on formal education, uh, if we focus on only this, those who are able to go to school. So uh, it should be noted that uh, just taking care of African youth to obtain this education for all is not just about safeguarding their human dignity, but also working towards ensuring sustainable development. We believe that uh, that person who drops out of school can still contribute to development uh, in so many ways, only if we come up with uh, ways of ensuring that they can function better, even though they didn't finish uh, earlier levels of education. Um, I want to give us an example of um, the Young Domestic Workers Protection and Professional Training. Now the question is, why young domestic workers? Because there are many African youth that are uh, involved uh, in um, domestic work. You may want uh, to note also that um, it is not easy to get a job in Africa and one of the most available jobs is domestic work. Uh, and therefore, one of the things we want uh, to appreciate is that uh, there are so many push and pull factors. Those factors that make children, youth, uh, women get into domestic work uh, even if they didn't want to. These include uh, gender issues, HIV and AIDS, socio-economic and cultural factors. It's also not good to note that um, the number of underage children involved in domestic work, which is perhaps dangerous for them, is very many. And because of um, that, there is also need to think about how do we remove these children from dangerous work just so that they can be able to benefit from education for all uh, in uh, their countries. And uh, I also want to note that uh, even when the youth get into domestic work, they face many challenges. And therefore, we have to think about how do we um, uh, put together a package that allows someone to get into domestic work and benefit from it? And uh, uh, how do we help them uh, face off the challenges that may be on their way because of their vulnerability? Some of these challenges include low wages, long working hours, uncertainty, violence, and sometimes, and really in many cases, abuse of human rights. Now, I know that uh, ILO has given lots of recommendations on how uh, domestic work should be uh, paid well and all that. Unfortunately, without any regulation of the domestic work itself, this is not possible. So this uh, project is about regulating uh, domestic work. 
our overall goal is to turn domestic work uh, in Kenya and in the other countries where the project is running, it's in five different African countries, to turn it into an enterprise of choice. Uh, decent employment that can take care of a lot of African youth. You will note that the demand for uh, domestic work in um, young economies is very, very high. And therefore, this is really a job that could easily be available. The strategy is um, multi-pronged, uh, considering that um, uh, there are many variables in domestic work, but it's going to involve functional literacy, education, and advocacy. Those two are the key. Functional literacy, education, and advocacy. Now, uh, one of the things that um, we have put together as the dimensions for the project is firstly to conduct a national survey. These surveys have been done in countries such as Burundi, but in Kenya this has not been done as yet. The purpose of the national survey is to map out the characteristics of domestic workers. Where are the children in domestic work? How can they be removed? Where, what are the needs of those youth that are already involved? What are the needs of women, you know, young women? What are the needs of young men? And better still, what are the training needs of both the domestic workers and the employers of these domestic workers? Secondly, uh, the project aims at putting together a curriculum for domestic workers. Among other things, this curriculum uh, would uh, include ways of standardizing domestic work. It will include literacy skills because we know very well the range of um, people involved uh, you know, include some who have never gone to school at all, so do not know how to read and write, and others who dropped at different levels of education and therefore have questionable literacy skills. But a key component is uh, also the learning of foreign languages, just so that uh, the, the market can be widened and um, uh, personal empowerment. We consider personal empowerment very, very key because uh, with uh, an, uh, an individual who is empowered, they can wade off abuse. They can be able to communicate, you know, that which they feel is not uh, right in various ways. And therefore, the teaching, this curriculum will be very, very flexible to enable somebody to work and seek this education at the same time. So that if uh, someone has to maybe uh, take off two hours a day, they can take off. If they would be able to do it on Sunday when they are off work, they can do it. And um, finally, we want to be able to push for a certificate you know, a trade test certificate which is recognizable so that if a, a domestic worker produces this certificate, we know they are qualified and we know uh, what they are capable of doing. The third dimension is advocacy. There's no way this project is going to work until we lobby for recognition and support for certified domestic workers. And this is best done by civil society organizations. Uh, and therefore, there will be a lot of need for direct and indirect awareness raising strategies, including media shows, workers' day parades, and the use of a documentary. I want to say that uh, as I Day International, we have uh, already uh, a, a documentary on domestic workers and the conditions that they go through. In this documentary, all the five countries where the project is being implemented are really, really brought out in terms of what are the characteristics and what are the conditions. Um, the fourth aspect would be implementation 
of the training. This will be done by identified mid-level colleges, churches, and other stakeholders. We know that uh, in a lot of countries, there are lots of mid-level colleges that are offering one type of uh, skills training or another, and they would be very, very important. But we also um, uh, are thinking in terms of uh, how can we register domestic workers into a trade union, just so that they can be able to also uh, uh, air their views in terms of the work that they do. Finally, uh, the sixth part will, of course, be monitoring and evaluation, and always feeding back into uh, some of uh, the learning that will happen as a result of uh, this monitoring and evaluation. In terms of timelines, we are looking at, uh, at a minimum of three years uh, to five years at most. IDEI recognizes that uh, this is a really, really intricate and delicate exercise because domestic workers are inside our homes. They're not in the public, and therefore you have to find strategies of um, you know, not disturbing the status quo most of the time. It is hoped that the demand for domestic work, which is very, very high, will propel the project because really in terms of um, marketability, there is no shortage for demand. And then IDE is only a team leader because of the realization that uh, there is really little that can be achieved without the involvement of local communities, uh, local civil society organizations, and local actors. So IDE only uh, pushes uh, the agenda, but in terms of implementation, in terms of pushing the agenda forward, this would be the work of um, the local communities. And ID has been uh, uh, very, very good in terms of trying to uh, fundraise, uh, put together the funding for this particular project. And therefore, we as international community also are partners in this because we've been raising uh, these funds. Now, in conclusion, I want to say that uh, IDA strongly believes that this project will capture the majority of youth that are out of school for one reason or another. Give them a chance to acquire education and also give them a chance for a livelihood, you know. And um, they will really, really uh, be able to acquire functional literacy skills training, as well as um, on-job training, which is very important. The project is therefore a sure way of regulating an industry which has been very, very difficult and eluded most of the efforts towards uh, regulating it. And in the long run, I want to say that the best way of redressing many of the challenges faced by domestic workers is really about making it professional, regulating domestic work itself by offering education, certification, and recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Un grand merci à Madame Okemwa qui qui a mis l'accent, si vous voulez, ou qui a réussi à mettre en lumière une... la vie d'une partie de la société à laquelle on ne s'intéresse peut-être pas beaucoup, souvent, en Afrique, la vie des jeunes domestiques. J'ai beaucoup aimé euh, le, le, le cheminement, en tout cas. Commencer par dire que l'accès à l'éducation, le chemin vers l'accès à l'éducation est parsemé d'embûches. C'est un chemin qui est difficile. À certains endroits, comme elle l'a souligné, dans certaines régions, c'est beaucoup plus compliqué quand on est une fille ou un garçon, parce qu'on ne le dit pas souvent, on parle beaucoup plus des filles, qu'il y a beaucoup de difficultés au niveau sociologique, économique, culturel et, et tant d'autres aspects, et terminer en mettant l'accent sur les, les jeunes domestiques dont on ne parle pas beaucoup, qui sont souvent victimes de, de, de sévices à l'intérieur même des maisons. Euh, c'est très important. Merci aussi pour ce projet qui qui vise à réguler cet aspect de la vie de ces jeunes filles et, et la mise en place de, de, de mécanismes comme le certificat ou, ou l'accès à, à l'éducation.
voilà, c'était un, un ressenti du terrain qui, qui était très bon et qui valait la peine d'être souligné. Merci encore. Maintenant, je vais passer la parole à Monsieur Philippe Camille Akoa. Il est le directeur du FEICOM, euh, le Fonds spécial d'équipement et d'intervention intercommunale. Euh, je vais vous laisser vous présenter. Euh, je tiens juste à souligner qu'il va aborder euh, le point de vue des autorités locales, euh, leur rôle et leur stratégie euh, dans, dans, dans le fait d'améliorer l'accès à l'éducation pour, le, pour les jeunes. Important aussi de souligner qu'ils ont encore organisé euh, ce panel. Voilà, Monsieur Camille, la parole est à vous. Vous avez 10 minutes. D'accord, je, je, je vous remercie. Euh, mesdames et messieurs, je vais non, vous, vous présenter faire, le cas d'une du, expérience du Cameroun qui est le Fonds spécial d'équipement et d'intervention intercommunale. Le Fonds spécial d'équipement et d'intervention intercommunale est une entreprise d'État au Cameroun qui a été créée en 1974 et dont le but est de gérer la partie de la fiscalité que l'État met à la disposition des communes et également de mobiliser des fonds en provenance de la coopération pour pouvoir financer les projets communaux. Alors dans le cadre de ces missions, le FECOM met à la disposition des communes des ressources de façon trimestrielle sur la base d'une péréquation. Donc les communes qui ont le plus d'habitants reçoivent également un peu plus de ressources. Mais ce que je vous présente aujourd'hui, c'est davantage le guichet qui est destiné au financement des projets communaux. Alors le FECOM finance plusieurs types de projets communaux, euh, des projets générateurs de revenus et également des projets sociaux. Et parmi ces projets sociaux, nous avons tout ce qui concerne les adductions d'eau, l'électricité, la construction des écoles et des salles de classe. Et je voudrais dire que euh, dans ce domaine particulier, celui de, de l'école, donc la construction des écoles et des salles de classe, euh, les financements sont donnés à 90% sous forme de subvention. Et il est demandé à la commune un apport de 10%. Si la commune n'a pas ces ressources-là, euh, donc le FECOM les lui donne sous forme de prêt. Et depuis euh, la dernière mandature, euh, parce que nous avons eu des élections législatives cette année, donc euh, depuis 2007 à, 2000, euh, à 2013, euh, le FECOM a eu à financer euh, pour, euh, des projets communaux pour un montant de 175 millions d'euros. Et dans les 175 millions d'euros, ce qui est destiné à l'éducation, donc construction des salles de classe, construction également de, euh, des équipements de table banc, cela représente à peu près 15% de nos financements, dont 26, euh, 26 millions d'euros. Et dans le cadre de ces missions, euh, l'atteinte des objectifs du millénaire pour le développement, euh, les Nations unies à travers ONU Habitat ont eu à reconnaître l'action menée dans le FECOM dans le cadre de faciliter aux maires l'atteinte de ces objectifs du millénaire pour le développement, ce qui a permis que l'institution puisse être reconnue avec le, le scroll of habitat qui est décerné tous les deux ans par les Nations Unies. Et je voudrais dire donc au cours de cette période-là, 11 000 salles de classe ont été construites, ce qui a bénéficié à 660 000 élèves. Et euh, il faudrait dire également que euh, dans les missions des communes, c'est la construction des écoles qui fait partie euh, de leur mission, étant donné que l'État assure euh, les programmes et également assure de son côté aussi euh, la gratuité de l'accès euh, à l'éducation. Donc j'ai voulu vous donner cette, précision, enfin, cette présentation de façon assez ramassée, peut-être que pour qu'au courant de nos échanges, nous puissions aller un peu plus en profondeur. Donc je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, M. Akoa, pour euh, cette mise en exergue du travail de terrain, encore une fois, au Cameroun, avec euh, la construction des écoles dans, dans les communes. On reviendra sûrement vers vous pour vous poser un peu plus de questions. Maintenant, je vais passer la parole à M. Bernard, qui nous vient de, du programme, euh, directeur du programme de Microsoft e-learning, qui va nous parler un petit peu de, de la manière dont on va permettre aux jeunes d'accéder à l'éducation en utilisant des, des outils euh, propres aux nouvelles technologies. I think you're going to speak in English, yes. so the floor is yours Thank and you. uh, feel free. Uh, I'd like to take a slightly different look at uh, access to education from the perspective of technology and the importance of education as a key economic driver in societies around the world. 
If I could have the slides behind me, please. Thank you. If, you. if you look at most classrooms around the world, they're very much set up the same way as they were about 100 years ago, uh, with students in rows of desks and a lecturer in the front of the classroom imparting knowledge to students. And it's ironic because we would never send ourselves or our families to an operating room that looked the same way as it did 100 years ago, yet we allow our education systems to be constructed in the same way they were 100 years ago. Next slide. And those uh, education systems were really geared toward an industrial workplace, where students who came out of the education system were not used to being able to think critically, to be able to use project skills. Today's workplace is very different. Today's workplace is one where multiculturalism, multilingualism, and uh, cross-geographic borders are very common. Even children who are coming out of school systems in developing countries need to understand how to work in very multicultural environments. It's very important that those students have the right skills to come out of the school system to be successful in work and life. What we see around the world is uh, many governments think that the answer to uh, some of the challenges in their education systems are devices for education, whether it's computers like this one, or laptops, or mobile phones, or tablets. Uh, they tend to think that those devices will change the education system, and those devices alone will help the education system transform into an education system of 21st century learners. And as we work with governments around the world, we try to dispel that notion so that the device is not the focus of the education system and of education transformation. This is a great example of a device being used in a school uh, where there was probably no teacher training or school leader training available. This is an $8,000 smart board uh, that was put into a school. Uh, it showed up on Facebook recently. And this was a teacher who was using this $8,000 device paid for her school by her school or by the government and using it as a bulletin board. And this is an example from my own country in the United States. Uh, but this is a common problem we see when technology lands in education systems that we don't see uh, 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 good teacher training, good school leader training, and then the devices become nothing better than an expensive bulletin board or a doorstop in the corner. So why is technology important, though, in the first place for governments? I want to step back and cite this study by the US Federal Reserve uh, several years ago. Uh, and we use this many times as governments are thinking about making investments in education uh, and in technology and education. We know that when technology is used effectively, there can be long-term economic benefits of using that technology in education systems. First of all, we see students coming out of the system with greater graduation rates, which means they'll have increased earnings and increased uh, tax revenues, therefore, uh, greater tax contributions to society. We'll see an increased use of e-government services and the idea that people can use better services because they're better educated, because they have come out of the school system with some basic skills and technology. Uh, we see reduced savings in crime and incarceration. It's a surprising one to many people. When people have a higher level of education, they're less likely to commit crimes, they're less likely to go to jail. Uh, and we see decreased reliance on publicly funded services. When these things are in place, we can actually map out the long-term economic viability of investments today in education technology for what will happen tomorrow. In the United States, for example, if we were to invest in all 9.5 million seniors in high school today with technology, we'd see a $1.3 trillion increase in net revenue and net GDP for the country over the next 15 years. So it's very quantifiable as governments start thinking about how to use technology effectively in their education systems. And at the core of it, though, is not the devices and not the technology, but it's the fact that teachers need to learn how to use technology more effectively to be innovative in their practice. And when we talk about innovative teaching, we think about it as you know, teachers who can allow students to gain those core skills that we know are going to be most important when they come out of the work system, when they come out of the school system and come into the workforce. Things like problem solving and innovation, global awareness and global citizenship, the idea of knowledge construction versus just learning, rote, rote learning, which happens in many systems. The idea of skilled communications and self-regulation and assessment, as well as collaboration skills. Those are the core 21st century skills that we know that innovative teaching can lead to. 
we actually did a study in uh, seven countries a couple of years ago to understand the relationship between innovative teaching practice and the acquisition of 21st century skills by learners, to understand if there's a strong correlation between those two things. Uh, this was a, a peer-reviewed uh, research project. It was run by SRI International, and uh, it was uh, both qualitative and quantitative and went all the way down to the classroom level and looked at actual assignments and what the students put out as a result of that assignment and then graded that against 21st century skills. We defined innovative teaching practice as teachers who allow students to live inside and outside the classroom, sorry, to work and learn inside and outside the classroom, to be able to drive their own learning journey at their own pace, and to be able to use technology effectively in their learning practice. And when teachers use those three things as part of their uh, lesson plan development, then students gain 21st century skills. And this was true in all of the seven countries we looked at in both developing and developed country circumstances. And we've since run this study in many more countries, and it remains true that when, when teachers use innovative practice, students gain 21st century skills. But the problem is most teachers do not know how to create lesson plans that create that innovative teaching practice and that opportunity for students to gain those 21st century skills. I want to pause now and just tell a quick story about one teacher who does this very well. Uh, and this is to prove that this is not just a developed or a developing market or a developed or developing country context. Uh, Moriehe Sakese is a teacher in Lesotho, and she teaches at, many, uh, at, at a school like many other schools in Africa on a dirt road with no electricity. She was able to get a laptop through a government program and was able to charge it at home and allow her learners to go collect plant data in the, uh, in the surrounding uh, community. And then they'd come back into her classroom and they'd use Excel to crunch the data and learn how, to, how the data compared to other sets of data. Very uh, a good practice of letting her learners learn inside and outside the classroom, using technology in appropriate ways until the battery ran out on her, on her laptop. She'd go home and charge it and a new group of learners would do it the next day. Uh, Moriehe was elected a uh, innovative teacher at an event that we do in Africa every year and then went from Mauritius to our global event in San Salvador, Brazil that year. And she was elected a global innovative educator by her peers at this event, some 700 educators. And the fact that Moriehe was there was unique in the first place given the circumstances of her school and the learners in her school. But what was more amazing was the fact that she was able to teach teachers from other parts of the world how to use this innovative practice. And then she went back, and she's been a catalyst for change with many other teachers uh, within her community. So that every year when we do this event, we see two or three teachers from Lesotho who come to our event every year as a result of the training that Moriehe has, has practiced. So that's one teacher who can make a difference across an entire society and can, uh, uh, is using innovative teaching practice in her own way. So at Microsoft, our approach to education system change is really about not just the technology in education or making sure that we have the right technology in education, but ensuring that we put the policy aspects in place, the right ICT strategies, working with the government, working in, con in the context of local countries to ensure long-term education transformation. At the core of that transformation is this idea of student-driven learning that learners need to drive their own learning journey at their own pace in their own way, and technology is a tool for that. They're only supported by good innovative teachers who use innovative practice, and there's lots of work we have to do around the world to ensure more teachers are using innovative practice. And we work very closely with school leaders as well to ensure that they're bringing a culture of change into the school. And this is very difficult in many places where technology has not been a part of the school in the past. We need to have the school leader ensure that they have a vision for technology in their school and a vision for how technology will affect their community. And then we work on a whole system change as well. In many developing contexts, it's very important that we work uh, in a coalition with other stakeholders in the government. Uh, and uh, or around the government. And the government needs to be at the center of this. So when we work on digital access programs, we work in partnership with the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of ICT, or other government uh, entities. Um, it's very important that we bring private sector into the equation. Besides Microsoft, we work with telcos, we work with publishers, we work with other uh, organizations that, are, that care about education that, in that country. Sometimes they're local enterprises as well as multinational enterprises. We uh, work very closely with NGO community, including advocacy groups and parent-teacher organizations. 
And then finally, we bring in development banks, whether they're local commercial banks or international uh, funding organizations, to work with the government, not just on funding devices or funding teacher training, but funding and thinking about a long-term ICT strategy where the government's at the center, and we work with all of these stakeholders around the sides to ensure that there's a long-term approach to effective use of ICT in education. Over the last couple of years, we've also signed partnerships with seven global NGOs. Uh, and uh, we've uh, committed $75 million in working with and through these organizations to drive change in countries around the world. We think the next uh, billion new learners are going to come out of the developing world. And uh, frankly, it's about how we build shared value, how we build value in those education systems, and how we build value in new markets for a company like Microsoft and other private sector players. And the NGOs become a very strong advocate and a strong uh, partner with us in many of these countries. Finally, I'd like to just talk about one project and the effect uh, that uh, investment can have with the private sector and, uh, and the social sector uh, across a, a number of different countries in Africa. A couple of years ago, we uh, invested $2 million with British Council to build a hub and spoke uh, model where we had a hub with a computer lab in one community that served many surrounding communities. Uh, and uh, we trained teachers at that hub and we allowed learners from different schools to come into that hub and be able to, to get access to technology for the first time, oftentimes accessing the internet for the first time as well. Uh, we worked in six uh, African countries that you can see listed there. And in just two years, we trained 20,000 teachers on how to effectively use technology in their lesson plans. And we reached 100,000 learners uh, in just two years with first time access to technology. Now this project is starting to scale. It's being funded by other donors. We're now, rather than just having a hub, we're putting technology labs in some of the spokes, which allows us to build additional hubs around those spokes. So it's a very effective model of doing teacher training and school leader training, but also ensuring that learners from various communities can get access to technology for the first time. And this is the power of the kinds of partnerships that we can bring to the table and the way that we like to work in partnership in developing countries. At the center of all six of these countries was the Minister of Education and the idea that we could transform education uh, policy through the example of this hub and spoke model. So if we did this with British Council, I'd just like to imagine what we could do with the European Union, other funders, other donors, and other NGOs who are out there working in education. And we're definitely open to those kinds of discussions. So with that, I'd like to close by just saying, as a private sector company, and I think the only private sector uh, representative on stage, it's really about partnership, and it's really about being a partner in learning, and being a partner in learning with governments, with NGOs, with the social sector, with the private sector, to ensure that we're changing education for the best in many countries around the world, so that these children uh, from Moriehe School here that I was with in Lesotho can see the future, can have some hope for the future uh, as they look to move uh, beyond the circumstances they're in today. Thank you. Un grand merci à Monsieur Bernard. Merci d'avoir euh, mis en exergue le fait que les objets de la nouvelle technologie doivent euh, faire partie des nouveaux types euh, d'enseignement. Même si quand vous avez commencé votre exposé, euh, la question que je me suis posée, c'est de dire comment est-ce qu'on per... on parle déjà d'un difficile accès à l'éducation Comment est-ce que on fait pour permettre que les élèves et les enseignants puissent avoir un enseignement de qualité en utilisant des objets comme ceux que vous proposez de, de, chez Microsoft. Merci d'avoir donné cet exemple du Lesotho qui devient du coup un exemple parlant, un exemple qui permet de dire que les choses peuvent se faire. Merci d'avoir souligné que vous travaillez avec les ministres de l'éducation même si des fois on aurait tendance à penser que ce sont des choses qui sont difficiles. Donc merci beaucoup pour cette co corrélation et entre le e-learning, donc l'éducation du 21e siècle, comme vous l'avez montré au début avec vos images, et le fait qu'on doit continuer à militer pour une accession facile à l'éducation de qualité pour tous. Je vais sans plus tarder passer la parole à M. Sakharov qui va nous faire l'honneur de conclure le panel. M. Sakharov qui est, travaille au ministère des Affaires étrangères de Lettonie. Et euh, voilà, c'est tout ce qui m'a été dit. Je vous laisse euh, conclure le panel. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor, but also a humbling experience to be here on a panel where you have people who are 
great experts with a deep experience in uh, uh, doing very important uh, things uh, uh, within the education uh, uh, systems in different countries. Uh, now, what I can, my two cents uh, uh, contribution to this discussion is going to be somewhat different. I'm going to speak from uh, the Latvian national perspective. Now, what uh, Latvia has to offer, in my mind, is uh, the experience with a very uh, deep socio-economic and political transition uh, during the last 23 years. And uh, we have been working closely with our friends and partners in uh, the former Soviet Union, uh, Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, uh, South Caucasus, also uh, the uh, Central Asian states, because for them, uh, we have the experience that is relevant because they have experienced more or less of the same uh, uh, system of governance and also education previously, but also we can communicate uh, this knowledge in languages and in ways that people in these partner countries find easy to understand. But also, uh, when, I, when I'm saying I would like to share some experiences with you, uh, this is not to say that Latvia as a country, as a nation, that we already have achieved all uh, those important goals, including the principle of leaving no one behind. We haven't done so completely. We're making further steps towards the horizon, but as you see, as you know, the horizon always moves uh, with every step we make. So uh, in this process, on the uh, issues I'm going to talk about, we also have something to learn still, to gather new experiences. But at the same time, I think we are ready to share these experiences and maybe uh, some other countries will find them useful or at least thought-provoking. I'd like to speak about two specific uh, aspects of uh, inclusive education that I find relevant for today. Uh, share some practical experiences. One is uh, concerning children with special needs. And the second one, if I still have time, uh, about the uh, linguistic and cultural diversity. Now, uh, uh, the, a recent UN issue paper on education quality uh, uh, in, in Europe and Central Asia uh, states that countries in these regions uh, are among the closest to achieving universal primary education, which is very good. The enrol enrollment rates are over 95%, but the education systems in these middle-income countries struggle to reach children with special needs. Now, due to certain beliefs, beliefs or attitudes, these children do not attend school, uh, sometimes risk uh, uh, not getting any skills, uh, not being able to integrate in the society in the future. Now, uh, this is a problem, this is an issue, uh, and of course, uh, in uh, Latvia, we also have children with special needs. Uh, now, uh, a Latvian NGO called the Latvian Portage Association has been quite successful in uh, dealing with this issue, both at home and also abroad. Uh, they have worked in countries like Azerbaijan and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, what they do is, uh, educate special needs children of a preschool age uh, and their families and social workers. The result is that uh, kids can join mainstream uh, preschool and secondary school uh, institutions. They attain mainstream kindergartens, play, uh, play groups, and uh, they have the possibility to uh, be on par with uh, the rest of the kids. Uh, this gives a uh, much better and uh, more equitable education uh, system. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, some of the conclusions that uh, uh, this NGO has made uh, from working with partners abroad is that it's important to have good contacts and direct cooperation on the local level with the local authorities. And it also means that you have to 
uh, involve the uh, representatives of the local authorities from the donor state who actually deal with these issues and problems. So I think this is something that a country like Latvia can offer in terms of experience uh, to uh, the others. A second issue, which is uh, quite different, uh, is the uh, linguistic and cultural diversity. And now Latvia is an extremely linguistically diverse uh, and culturally diverse society, has been so uh, for centuries. And of course, we, here we are not talking about special needs uh, but I think uh, this allows us to think an about another aspects of inclusive, aspect of inclusiveness. We usually uh, think, first of all, of uh, the moral uh, concepts and uh, the principles of fairness and uh, equality. Now, when we speak about dealing successfully or effectively with diversity, I think another consideration to have in mind is that diversity, uh, when dealed, dealt with, uh, in the right way uh, is a huge resource. And here is the Latvian example. We have minority education uh, programs for secondary schools in eight minority languages. Uh, the official language of Latvia, which is Latvian, and the minority lang languages such as Russian, Belarusian, Ukraine, Polish, and so on and so on, they are integrated. As a result, you have children who uh, absolutely feel included in the society because they operate in the uh, language, in the lingua franca of, of the particular country, but they also feel they have retained and multiplied the linguistic and cultural heritage of their parents. So this is a win-win situation. How does it promote growth? Now I can tell you uh, uh, that uh, the, the Latvian banking sector relies heavily on the linguistic competencies of, uh, of these uh, people, not just those who attended these schools, but also, uh, generally speaking, people with a linguistic qualification. Uh, the customers in the East are quite confident uh, dealing with a Latvian financial institution that can offer service in this particular language, and vice versa. Uh, you have people with different ideas, different outlooks to the world. So this cultural element, this cultural diversity also brings new solutions and allows to deal much more effectively with uh, uh, the challenges. And this goes for, goes for the other uh, areas, other uh, businesses as well. So I think this uh, is a very good example of how schools, uh, schools or school, a school system that is geared towards respecting diversity promoting it, encouraging it, actually contributes to a society that is not, not only much more fair, equal, stable, but also uh, has much better uh, preconditions for growth and competition on the global market. Thank you very much. Merci, merci beaucoup pour votre conclusion et merci pour ces exemples concrets que vous venez uh, d'apporter à, à, à ce débat. Maintenant, sans plus attendre, je pense qu'on va entrer dans la partie la plus intéressante et la plus vive de, de cette rencontre de l'après-midi, c'est-à-dire euh, l'échange avec vous, la salle. Et ici, on a un dispositif assez particulier, vu que la première question revient à un jeune homme qui est parmi nous, M. Chernorba, qui est un jeune ambassadeur, Youth Ambassador, qui va avoir le privilège et l'honneur de poser la première question à nos panélistes. M. Chernorba nous vient des États-Unis. Il est Sierra Leone. Il est très impliqué dans toutes les questions qui concernent l'éducation. Donc, sans plus attendre, je vous passe la parole. Et ensuite, je pense qu'il y aura un système pour que le micro puisse circuler à l'intérieur de la salle. Voilà. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, thanks to the, all of the panelists uh, for what has truly been a remarkable um, panel, remarkable session. I wanted to just say before I ask my question very briefly that I think this panel is particularly important because one of the things that we've been talking about with young people around the world is how do we make the post-2015 process different from the MDGs? And not only because of the consultation and the, the, that we have now, but also in a way that means everybody around the world feels a sense of responsibility to achieve them. That it's not about setting a set of new goals that the donor countries are going to give us money to implement or something, 
but that how do we have a mandate that brings everybody on board, whether you're in the global north or in the global south, and we're all hands on deck and say this is the new human development mandate. And I think this panel demonstrates uh, a potential for that. So congratulations to you all and, and thanks for that. Few questions. Uh, first, Karen. You mentioned that uh, only about 1.5% of uh, humanitarian aid goes to education. Um, and one of the problems generally we hear about education funding is that, for example, compared to Global Fund for Health, often we, we ask for less, we're a little bit less ambitious in education, but when you ask across the board, everybody agrees that education is a top priority. So with your replenishment efforts that you mentioned, how can we be a little bit more ambitious? And how can we get everybody on board, including businesses and young people, to push that envelope a little bit? Because 1.5% in funding for education in, human, in humanitarian situations, when uh, we have 28 million plus young people out of school because of emergencies is clearly not enough. Uh, Dr. Okonwa, uh, your, your, your point about domestic uh, domestic workers. You talked about trying to regulate the industry and also uh, make sure that people feel a sense of dignity while being domestic workers. My fear with that, while I, I applaud such an initiative, is how do you take into consideration the fact that first I know a lot of people who, a lot of young people who are domestic workers see it as entirely an entry measure. So if you're, if you're legislating it and then making it kind of like the norm, um, how do you create that upward mobility for people? And even more challenging is a lot of domestic workers actually are members of the family in Africa. So how do you formalize a sector that is inherently informal? Uh, finally, uh, for I'll ask a question to uh, Mr. Bannard uh, from the business side. Um, I have to say, I'm really delighted to see that as a business, Microsoft is playing a leading role here uh, on education. Because I think one of the big concerns we have with business as young people is that businesses don't invest enough in education. And even when they do, it seems paltry. It seems like it's kind of self-serving. If you're in, a, in technology, you invest in technology. But if you look at this data, you see that uh, in Africa alone, uh, by 2020, if we go at this rate, you, be having, you will not have anybody to employ. So the first big question is, how do you see yourself as businesses playing an even more critical role and an even bigger role in investing in education? So you're investing in your own employees in the future. And finally, how do you democratize uh, uh, the technology that you talked about? Because I feel like a lot you talked about you need the technology, but you always talked about how you also need teachers in the process. We definitely do need teachers, but what in sectors, for example, we have a shortage of millions of teachers in the world. In my country, in Sierra Leone, I went to schools where there were 200 or 40 in our classrooms. Impossible huh? uh, to gain education. Can you think about technology bridging that gap in a way that you don't necessarily need? You need a teacher, but maybe that teacher can be somewhere else from around the world and technology kind of providing that interaction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Est-ce que vous avez besoin que je revienne sur les questions ou vous allez directement répondre les uns après les autres? OK, alors vous pouvez commencer pour ouvrir le bal. Well, maybe I'll, the first question was to me, so maybe I'll start to, first to say thank you very much to Cherner. And for those of you who don't know him, Cherner is the chair of the Youth Advocacy Group for the Global Education First Initiative, and he probably knows more about education than the rest of us here. So I hope maybe next year the Dev Days organizers will put the youth representatives on the panel to give their statements rather than just asking questions. But they were very good questions. Um, the crisis in humanitarian... Uh, in finance for education and humanitarian aid is, uh, is one we've been struggling with as with the general crisis in education finance. And I think the questions you ask, if we had those answers, we would know. It's true. Uh, it's very easy to mobilize. It's much easier to mobilize for health issues. So as people be, say that, you, you know, it's very much more concrete. You can see the results day to day. But I think that's not true for education. I think you, you actually can see results in terms of uh, 
uh, in terms of education. So we need to work on our story. We need to have a better story to tell to show why uh, that investment will lead to results in education. We need better leadership. Uh, I think we need to, we have a few very strong leaders. We need to activate them and bring more people on board to really uh, push for education, including the leaders uh, from our developing country partners who are very committed. Um, and then I think we need to actually then be able to demonstrate the results. We need to be able to show, quantify uh, how, what money goes in and what comes out for it, which means working on better strategies and solutions. I think we have the answers to the problems, but we're not telling our story uh, well enough. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you for the very good question. I want to say that one of the biggest challenges with domestic work is the informality. The informality breeds a lot of abuse, that a relative is going to take someone's child out of school and then take them somewhere else to be employed. If there is regulation, then we can do away with a relative taking someone's child out of school. Now, the first question you asked um, was, how do we ensure upward mobility? Now, let me s respond to this very generally, but also very specifically. Uh, I want to use the example of um, Burundi, where there was um, you know, a, an, a program put together to educate domestic workers. Now, the domestic workers have a choice. You know, first of all, they are trained in everything to do with domestic work. And secondly, they are given a choice of a trade that they can learn. So some choose driving, others choose uh, tailoring, others choose modeling and all that. And therefore, in our model for domestic workers, while as much as possible we want dignity in domestic work so that people can work within domestic work, we also want to give them a choice. Whoever doesn't want to stay does not have to stay anyway because any, the skills they will have learned, including uh, literacy skills, the functional skills, can help them work elsewhere. So in Burundi, those who are trained as domestic workers end up in hotels as chefs, as waiters, and they're very, very good at uh, the work that they do. And um, there, is no, um, there is no industry where all people are going to be the same. And therefore, what we envision in our project is to have different qualifications for domestic workers so that um, if you have done trade test one, you are different from trade uh, test three. If you have uh, uh, superb skills in laundry, you are different from that other person who does not have those kinds of skills. So essentially, because domestic work is about so many skills, ranging from cooking to laundry to cleaning to child care, first aid and all that. You can imagine how many opportunities a trained domestic worker would have and in the various fields. So essentially we are not saying stay in domestic work if you don't want. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to commend your questions. They're very good. And I think we could spend uh, the next two hours uh, answering the questions on technology, but I'll try to go quickly. I might say that we could get better investment in education if we had somebody like Brad Pitt uh, with us uh, helping promote education. And uh, maybe there's some celebrity tie-ins we can do to promote the cause of education. Uh, as it relates to uh, the private sector and to technology uh, and, and how we invest in education, um, you know, business has a critical role to play in this, and I think as we look to the post-MDG goals, uh, you or we can't think of the private sector as being separate from what other stakeholders uh, have in the game as it relates to this. In the same way youth need to have a voice, the private sector has an important voice. Uh, and as it relates to education, it's very important to us as a private sector employer that uh, uh, the employees of the future are coming out of school systems with the right skills to be employable. 
And if they have those 21st century skills, they are going to be the employees of our future. Obviously, they'll be the customers of our future, but they'll also be the competitors uh, and the enterprise uh, uh, developers and the small business owners of the future as well. So it's critical that we develop these skills, and that's why we as Microsoft make those commitments and make these investments in education. Over uh, uh, the last 11 years, we've had a program called Partners in Learning in which we have uh, invested $500 million. We just renewed it for another $250 million for the next five years in which we've, uh, we, we work with uh, governments to help uh, expand the education system as I talked about. We don't promote this a lot because it's not about promotion. It's not about a CSR program. It's really about how we build shared value. And I use that term very specifically because part of the value is helping us obviously build a market in a different country for the future. And as a private sector company, we have a, a, a responsibility to our shareholders to do that, but we can't do it at the expense of the local educational context. And there needs to be value in it for the education system and value for uh, the missions of other stakeholders like NGOs. Uh, I would agree that the next uh, several years in countries like Africa are going to be an incredible uh, set of market growth. In Africa, as many people probably know, 50% of the uh, population is under the age of 20 today. And McKinsey says that by 2020, there'll be 130 million uh, African households in middle class. So the private sector better be looking at the emerging markets as the growth for the next uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, and in that, there should be a lot of investment going into those markets. It's not just from a market perspective, but also hopefully from a shared value perspective where we can add that, uh, that in uh, and make sure that the education systems are transforming appropriately. Uh, in answer to your question about the democratization of technology, this is a very difficult one, and, and it's one that we spend a lot of time thinking about how to give access to more technology to more people. Uh, we've made Office 365 free for every school system in the world. Any school in any country that has Office 365 can get that for free today uh, as a way of uh, making a product investment in education systems. Um, we also are looking at different ways of thinking about uh, how technology plays a role. Obviously, Skype is a way that uh, many people can connect in different places with uh, you know, schools that may not have a teacher regularly, could connect with another school that has a teacher in the classroom every day. We've seen some very interesting work coming out of the UK, if anyone's familiar with uh, Professor uh, Sugatra Mitra, has done a very interesting work with uh, grandmothers who are retired in the UK reading uh, books to children in India via Skype. Uh, these are children who don't have access to regular teachers, and they're learning to read and speak English as a result of retired grandmothers in the UK reading to them over Skype. So there are some very interesting projects and, and small proofs of concept underway today. There's a lot more we can do as a technology industry to bring down the barriers, and we need to work in partnership with others to do that as well. So thank you for your questions. Merci à, à tous pour vos réponses. Je pense qu'on a un petit peu débordé sur le temps, donc j'ai droit, apparemment, euh, je n'ai même pas droit, en fait, à prendre des questions dans la salle. C'est très frustrant pour moi aussi. Mais euh, voilà, il est trois heures, donc euh, il va être temps de, de, de faire le résumé. Je, je m'excuse, vraiment. Euh, je pense que, comme moi, vous avez tous été emportés par, euh, par les différentes interventions. Donc, en gros, si on devait euh, résumer un petit peu, c'est un exercice très difficile de funambule que je vais essayer de faire maintenant. En gros, en arrivant ici, euh, on a tous une idée en tête. On se dit qu'on vient parler du post-cadre 2015, que parmi les différents objectifs millénaires du développement, on apprenait euh, l'accès à l'éducation pour tous. On arrive tout doucement euh, vers l'année euh, de l'échéance. Un nouveau cadre a été mis en place et je pense que ce type d'initiative fait partie justement de la préparation du poste cadre 2015 et l'éducation, comme vous l'avez entendu tout au long de cette heure et demie, occupe et occupera une place importante. Si je, devrais reveni si je devais revenir sur les différentes interventions, Madame Schro a commencé en, par poser un cadre, à dire qu'il y a un souci au niveau de l'éducation qui a une coupe drastique dans les fonds apportés à l'éducation. Elle milite, elle et son organisation, et vous invite euh, au mois de juin à participer à une conférence, justement pour continuer à pousser les, les donateurs à, à mettre de l'argent dans l'éducation et à permettre à tout le monde d'arriver à une éducation de qualité.
vaste programme et j'espère qu'on se retrouvera en tout cas au mois de juin. Madame euh, okay, moi qui nous vient du Kenya, a souligné le fait que l'accès à l'éducation en Afrique reste un défi important. C'est un défi important et que chacun d'entre nous qui, sommes, qui avons eu la chance d'aller à l'école, d'avoir accès à l'éducation, devons d'une manière ou d'une autre apporter notre pierre à l'édifice. C'est ce qu'elle fait au Kenya dans son travail à travers les organisations avec lesquelles elle travaille, dont fait partie ID. Elle a souligné euh, à juste titre cette population de jeunes filles marginalisées que sont les domestiques qui ont la charge de travailler dans les maisons, qui sont maltraitées, qui n'ont pas l'accès à l'éducation. Elle a pointé un fait très important. Souvent, ces domestiques font partie des familles en Afrique. C'est-à-dire que ce sont des enfants qui sont ravis à l'un ou l'autre membre de la famille pour venir servir dans une autre famille et qu'elles n'ont pas accès à l'éducation. Aujourd'hui, c'est qu'elles prônent, c'est une régularisation de ce secteur de travail, permettre à ce que ces jeunes filles soient le plus informées sur leurs droits, sur le fait que, comme toutes les autres, elles ont accès à l'éducation. Et euh, à travers son projet, elle prône aussi un certificat pour ces jeunes filles. Elle a donné un exemple, des exemples parlants dans son pays ou au Burundi, où les jeunes filles accèdent de plus en plus à l'éducation, et notamment ces jeunes filles euh, domestiques. Monsieur, euh, Monsieur du Foscom nous a parlé euh, de, des actions qui se passent euh, au Cameroun, des autorités locales qui militent pour mettre les enfants à l'école. On a tendance à penser que les, les, les autorités ne sont pas là ou ne travaillent pas. Aujourd'hui, on avait un exemple parlant du fait que les autorités locales, même si souvent dans les pays en Afrique, on a un problème de décentralisation des pouvoirs, on a ce type de problème. Ici, on avait un exemple parlant du fait que dans certaines communes, les autorités locales mettent la main à la pâte pour mettre les enfants à l'école. Ensuite, on a eu un éclairage très important et très intéressant de M. Bernard qui vient nous parler au nom de Microsoft. Et comme l'a dit notre jeune ambassadeur, j'ai eu le même ressentiment quand M. Bernard a commencé de me dire « On parle de Microsoft, même pour certaines personnes ici, en Occident, la technologie reste un apanage pour des personnes privilégiées. Ce n'est pas tout le monde qui a accès à la technologie. » M. Bernard est venu nous montrer que la technologie doit faire partie intégrante de l'éducation. On doit utiliser tous les objets de nouvelles technologies pour y arriver. Alors oui, on aurait tendance à penser que c'est quelque chose et c'est un domaine très fermé, un domaine très coûteux aussi, très onéreux. Mais on a eu l'exemple du Lesotho, qui fait partie d'un des nombreux exemples que vous avez cités, où on a une jeune professeure qui utilise les outils de la nouvelle technologie. Et comme une toile d'araignée, le principe d'Internet d'ailleurs, le savoir se répand à travers toutes les autres, tous les autres, les autres villages qui utilisent ces nouvelles technologies. Et puis, monsieur... Sakharov nous a fait l'honneur de, de conclure tout à l'heure en nous parlant aussi d'exemples bien concrets euh, en, en Europe de l'Est où des programmes sont mis en place pour permettre aux minorités d'accéder à l'éducation. Voilà, je pense n'avoir rien oublié. Euh, J'espère que vous avez passé une chouette après-midi, que vous avez pu apprendre beaucoup de choses, surtout des exemples de terrain. Vraiment, je pense que ce qui est important ici, c'est de se rendre compte que même quand on aurait tendance à penser que certains gouvernements sont aux abonnés absents, la population ne se croise pas les doigts et euh, continue à chercher à, à, à permettre au plus grand nombre d'avoir accès à l'éducation. Monsieur Bernard disait que dans quelques années, euh, la, les, les personnes, en tout cas instruites, et la nouvelle technologie aura une place importante dans les pays en voie de développement. C'est tout ce qu'on souhaite et on souhaite que justement chacun des apports et chacune de vos expertises mises ensemble puissent créer des synergies pour permettre un boom de l'éducation et un accès à l'éducation de qualité dans les pays en voie de développement. Voilà, je vous remercie tous pour votre attention et euh, je pense que vous pouvez discuter avec les orateurs euh, sur le côté. Voilà, bon après-midi.